Common misconceptions among oncologists. Myth, nutrition has nothing to do with cancer. Fact, the health of all animals and plants is heavily dependent on nutrition. Nup nutrition improves outcome in cancer treatment. I find it staggering how obvious this is. We have Dr. Joel Wallach in the audience here, a double doctorate in veterinary medicine and naturopathic degree. All animals, there's a rigorous effort to make sure that the animal's diet is healthy. Unless you want to sacrifice it at age two, in which we don't care if it's healthy, we feed them whatever we want. Um, Next myth, antioxidants are both expensive urine and will neutralize the benefits of chemo and radiation. False. In fact, we find that they'll give the antioxidant drugs, amifostine, mesna, destrazazone, with chemo, and those are effective at reducing the toxic side effects. For instance, vitamin E helps to reduce neurotoxicity from cisplatinum. Once the damage is done, that's another story, but there's clear evidence that it does not reduce the effectiveness of these drugs. And then finally, sugar has nothing to do with cancer outcome. Then why did you just buy a $1.5 million PET scan, which injects radioactively labeled sugar into the bloodstream, and then they use a Geiger counter device to track where the sugar went, because that's where the cancer is, because we've known for 60 years that cancer is an obligate glucose metabolizer. So there is a link there. And we come to the issue of adaptive forces of natural selection from toxic to essential. The first and worst pollutant on the planet Earth was oxygen, generated by blue-green blue algae, and it killed everything nearby. But eventually things started adapting, and it went from toxic to tolerated to essential, which it is for us. Sunlight, same thing. It's ionizing radiation, it's x-rays, it's carcinogenic, it's mutagenic, and it's essential because we have adapted from toxic to tolerated to essential. And the same thing with many of these other factors in our bodies. And you're going to see that as we look at whole foods, we've adapted to require foods in their native natural form. That means you raise animals humanely. There's a wonderful uh, booth back by mine, Certified Humane. If you raise an animal humanely, suddenly it's healthier. It's full of better nutrients, not full of cortisol. There are nutritional advantages to that. Uh, and we'll look at things like CLA. Applied human clinical nutrition, what we find is below this red line is surviving. Basic protein, carbohydrate, fat, fiber, minerals, vitamins. We'll send you into space with a uh, toothpaste thing full of food, and we think we can keep you alive for 60 days. As opposed to thriving means minor dietary constituents, conditionally essential nutrients, quasi-vitamins, and others, ultra-trace minerals that are essential for thriving in good health. What is not in whole foods? Well, is no antibiotics, growth hormones, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, hormone disruptors, toxic metals, aflatoxins. They're not in whole foods. What is in whole foods? Now we start getting to where it's a great big question mark. We don't know. One of the greatest scientists of all, Sir Francis Bacon, said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. And Albert Einstein, the greatest scientist of the 20th century, said, look deep into nature, and then you will understand everything better. What is in Whole Foods? As our analytical equipment has become more sensitive, we see more in our Whole Foods. Louis Pasteur, 100 years ago, was looking with primitive tools. We now have much more modern analytical equipment. What do we see in those Whole Foods? If you look at the... Um, the power of the analytical equipment. We used to look at foods 10 to the squared power, parts per hundred, 10 to the uh, second power. We're now looking at whole foods at 10 to the 15th power, or parts per quadrillion, which sounds like our federal deficit right now, but what we're, <laughs> we're finding is as the analytical equipment keeps getting more sensitive, we keep saying, I didn't know that was in there. This is amazing. And so we have a Video, actually we don't, but that's okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, next slide. I think it's, there we go. Reasons for an omnivorous diet. Um, carnivore nutrients, conjugated linoleic acid. When Lewis and Clark went out west, they found that there were many groups of Native Americans who followed the buffalo herd. And there were millions of buffalo, and these people, 90% of their diet was buffalo. And they were lean, mean, athletic creatures, and they had no heart disease and no cancer. But the buffalo, or ruminants, were raised on green grass, which is converted in the stomach into conjugated linoleic acid, which is a powerful anti-cancer agent. Back to the business of raise animals the way they were supposed to be. 
um, icosapentaenoic acid in fish oil, cartilage, glycosaaminoglycans. These are regulators. I had the privilege of working with John Pruden, MD, PhD, who worked on bovine cartilage. And he said it's a growth regulator. These things actually tell the body, you don't need to grow anymore. Carnitine, glandular extracts, CoQ, B12, zinc, these are not in this group. And I agree with uh, Charlotte Gerson, the largest land animals are herbivores, but the fastest and the smartest land animals are omnivores. <laughs> Moving on here, herbivores, nutrients, we have carotenoids, bioflavonoids, sterilins such as beta-cetosterol, fiber. They said in the 1900s, fiber, you can't digest it or absorb it, take it out of the food, it doesn't matter. And then they realize in the gut, fiber is de uh, decomposed into butyrate, which is a powerful anti-cancer substance. Potassium, antifungals, chlorophyll, curcumin, elagic acid, fucoidins, as there's in uh, seaweed, eat kelp. And what we find is an omnivorous diet. Ask any physiologist and they will tell you the human gut is like that of a pig. We are omnivores. We can eat almost anything. That's why we spread around the planet Earth. Diaspora, go out and colonize the planet Earth because we can eat anything. Vegetarian, one who practices vegetarianism, or a Native American phrase meaning bad hunter. <laughs> what are we having tonight, honey? Let's have a look at Weston Price, the original Indiana Jones, the Darwin of nutrition and dentistry. Weston Price, with his wife, a nurse, got on these Pan Am Indiana Jones airplanes around 1937, and they traveled the world, and they visited 14 cultures on five continents, and they found across the board, it didn't matter what they ate, fish and fruit, uh, cheese and oats, pumpkin and deer. Uh, it didn't matter what they ate as long as it was their native indigenous diet and there was no refined foods. In other words, the adaptive forces of nature. Over the course of eons, our body has required the things that are in there we don't fully understand. So see, these are some photos from the Price Pottinger Foundation. This, these are two people from the Seminole group, Indians. She's eating a native diet and has great teeth. She started eating a processed diet. These are of the same time frame and has terrible teeth, ready for the orthodontist. Uh, down here, Samoans eating a native diet, fish, flesh, and this person started eating sugar uh, and they need the orthodontist. Uh, so you're saying, all right, great, but I've got genetic problems. My mother had breast cancer, my father had diabetes, my goose is cooked. I don't think so. Now we start looking at can lifestyle improve the repair of defective DNA? Uh, this is where we looked at a great study done by Ornish and colleagues published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in which they looked at 30 men with indolent or slow-growing prostate cancer. Uh, they took a needle biopsy from their prostate and then they gave them a 30-day intervention program. Uh, and a, excuse me, three-month inter intervention program. So before and after, they did these uh, assessment of microarrays, the DNA that was in this prostate fluid, and they found 48 up and 453 down, meaning they turned on or off switches in the DNA based upon lifestyle changes. What did they do? Diet, plant-based, whole food, low fat, exercise, and stress management. I think Americans are drowning in cortisol, a stress hormone. If you can ratchet that back, you can make big improvements in health. And so they found all of these were side effects that were all good things. Conclusions. This pilot study is the first to show genetic changes in cancer patients based solely on lifestyle intervention. You're not a prisoner to your genes. Another study, can a healthy lifestyle lower overall mortality? The Hale Project. They looked at 1,500 men and 800 women in Europe, ages 70 to 90. They looked, this is a 12-year follow-up study, and what they found is adherence to a Mediterranean diet. In general, that means fish, poultry, uh, legumes, grains, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, tomato, olive, garlic, naps, red wine, exercise. That's a Mediterranean lifestyle. And they found that those who adhered to a Mediterranean diet cut their overall risk for mortality by 23%. If you adhered to an exercise program, you cut it by 37%. No smoking cut it by 35%. Moderate alcohol intake cut it by 22%. And this is a subject that I could spend another half hour on of hormesis. 
uh, there seems to be some benefits in modest amounts of red wine. And then if you put it all together, they cut their risk for all-cause mortality by 65% in a lifestyle program. 